Hey everybody, Leah Klett here with The Christian Post, and I'm so excited today to be talking to Ali Beth Stuckey. She is the host of The Relatable Podcast. She's a mother, she's an author, and her latest book is called Toxic Empathy. This is one of the best book titles I've ever seen, Toxic Empathy. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's just jump right in. And I want to hear from you about how empathy, which is a trait, you know, that Christians really should be known for, how can this trait turn toxic? Yes. So empathy really is not a biblical command. Empathy means to feel how someone else feels. That can be good or it can be bad. It's not virtuous in itself. If I feel how, say, a fellow mom feels when she is trying to shush her crying baby on an airplane, the feeling that I have that, wow, I've been there. I know how that is. I know exactly the anxiety that she's feeling right now. That can motivate me to do something that is virtuous, which is offer help, is self-sacrifice. You can offer her your kindness, your generosity, your care, your attention. But also uh, there are people who are in that position and who might not choose virtue, who might not choose selflessness and who might instead choose to be annoyed or to be frustrated or to put their own wants and needs first. Empathy can motivate us toward love. It can also blind us to reality or morality. And an example of that, that I would give in my book, if you feel the feelings of the woman who is considering abortion and you feel her, all of her anxiety, you feel all of her fear, you feel all of her desire to graduate from college or whatever it is, that can be a good thing to understand where she's coming from. But if that is all that you feel, if you are so in her feelings that you are blinded to the other side of that moral equation, which is the life of the unborn child, well, then you've just made a calculation to affirm her choice in the name of empathy at the expense of the child whose life is being lost in an abortion. And that same calculation, that same formula comes into play when it's about gender and so-called gender identity or the definition of marriage or even immigration and justice issues. Empathy for only one particular victim, which is what progressive activism kind of wants us to do with our empathy, blinds us to the needs and the well-being of everyone else involved. And it also obscures our uh, understanding of what the facts are, what the science is, and what the Bible says about these issues. In your book, you discuss how phrases like abortion is healthcare or love is love are really used to simplify these really complex issues. So talk about how these mantras really do exploit empathy and what are the dangers of adopting them instead of critical analysis? Yeah, that's such a good question. So these mantras are very circular. The love is love or the abortion is health care. Um, without defining those terms, what is love? What is health care? What is an abortion? What is a woman? What is justice? They're really meaningless. They're vapid, but that's all good propaganda. All good propaganda is really meaningless, but sounds really good. It's meant to tug on your heartstrings. It's meant to evoke an emotional response and an emotional defense, but not really supposed to seep into the critical thinking part of your brain. And yet when we do take a step back and we simply ask, well, what do you mean by that? Or what is the definition of, for example, justice? What is the definition of a woman? Then we start to see those mantras break down. And as people who are made in God's image, who have been given the capacity for critical thought, who have been given these amazing minds for wisdom and understanding, who get to ask for wisdom from God as Christians, and we are promised to receive the wisdom that comes from above, we should really put our thinking caps on, employ the wisdom and the critical thinking abilities that God has given us to define these terms, to ask what they factually mean to ask what is scientifically, for example, an abortion? Where does the abortion industry in the United States come from? What is the ideology behind this? And most importantly, what does God's word say about life from the moment of conception? What does God's word say about the intentional killing of an innocent person, which is what abortion is? When we start asking those questions, we become really, really good at combating propaganda. 
How are we seeing this sort of toxic empathy, as you put it, infiltrate the church, though? Because I think we are seeing it more and more. And what are some practical steps that church leaders can take to address this issue? Yeah, we saw in the summer of 2020, a lot of people saying Christians are called to lead by empathy. That's how we should determine our politics. That's how we should decide which policy is best, whether it's COVID policy, whether it's justice policy. We first must lead with empathy. That's actually awful, terrible advice. I see that within the church because people, they do a few things that I think are uh, mistaken. One, they conflate empathy with love. Empathy and love are not the same thing. I can feel how you feel. And again, kind of as we already said, that could motivate me toward doing something loving, or it could blind me to say the baby in the womb that is being victimized by abortion. So feeling what someone feels is not the same thing as love. God is love, First John 4, 8. So he gets to define what it is. He gets to say what it is. And nowhere in all of scripture do we read that love means feeling what someone else feels. Love, regardless of how you feel about a person, regardless of if you can feel their pain, if you've been there before, if you've experienced what they've experienced, love is defined in First Corinthians 13 as a lot of things. But one of the things is that it never rejoices in wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Empathy really has no concern with what is actually true. It's only concerned with how someone feels, which can only get you so far. But love, as we read in scripture by the God who created it, is inextricably intertwined with truth. And so this truth in love approach is much better, more substantive, more profound, and much more biblical than this superficial toxic empathy which emotionally manipulates people into only focusing on one particular victim and affirming whatever that person wants. And so that's one erroneous conflation that we see, I think, within the church, empathy and love. But then we also just get the misunderstanding of how we make policy decisions. Thomas Sowell said that politics is about trade-offs. Every policy is a trade-off. Not everyone in every policy can be served equally. The truth is when it comes to immigration policy, when it comes to like a justice policy, um, there are going to be people on both sides of a story that could say, I am harmed by this or this hurt me. For example, if we're talking about immigration, you hear the story about the young mom who was fleeing Colombian violence. And so she crossed the border illegally. She's here. She's built a life in Ohio. She's working really hard. And then she's afraid of Donald Trump's presidency because she might get deported. The media might tell that story. And through empathy, like I can put myself in that mom's shoes and think that's horrible. And I totally understand why she would want to leave Colombia's great gang violence. I get why she tried to cross the border illegally. But then on the other side of the illegal immigration conversation, we have Lake and Riley. Lake and Riley was a young woman who was jogging in Athens, Georgia on a Sunday afternoon and was brutally murdered by a Venezuelan illegal immigrant who crossed the border because of open border policies. And now she's gone in the prime of her life. The same was true of Molly Tibbetts. The same was true of Kate Steinle, all killed because of deliberate open borders policies that were put in place. Um, and so if we've got two stories on both sides of the issue that could pull on our heartstrings we could go back and forth all day on who has like the more emotional anecdotes and who has the sadder story so christians have to say okay it can't be then about what i feel because i can feel for both of those people and if we can feel for both of those people we're never going to be able to come to a policy that we think properly affirms what those people want and need the question we have to ask them when it comes to policy is what is true yeah. What is true? So what does the Bible have to say about borders and walls and security and even immigration? Now, I'm not saying that the Bible has a clear cut, explicit answer for modern day America on every single nuanced political topic. But I do think that we can look to scripture for the general principles of justice, of even uh, borders and national sovereignty, and we can draw wisdom from that. And that is the Christian's obligation to go past just what we feel or how another person feels and ask ourselves what is true. What are a few signs that Christians can look out, look at to watch if their empathy is turning into 
you know, affirmation and caving on these foundational truths? What are some really practical things we can look for? Yes. If your empathy for someone is encouraging you or tempting you to compromise on biblical truth. So for example, someone comes to you and says, you know, I've always felt like I was born in the wrong body. Say it's, you know, your friend from high school and she's a young woman, but she says, I've always felt like I was really a boy. I've always felt more masculine. You can empathize for the confusion that she feels for the distress that she might feel being so uncomfortable in her own skin. And you can even feel sympathy for the fact that she wants to feel free, that she wants to feel authentic. She wants to feel like her real self. But if those feelings that you have for her lead you to affirm that which is not factually true, and more importantly, what is not biblically true, okay, then we're in troubled water. Then we are falling into the trap of thinking that we are nicer than God that we are more loving than God, that we are more compassionate than God by disagreeing with him. But since God is love, the most loving thing we can always do is agree with God. Even if the world calls that mean, even if the friend in the moment called that judgmental, we can be kind, we can be gentle, we can be understanding while still, un while still believing and affirming that God's ways are better. And if God says that he made us male and female, anyone who tries to live outside of that reality is ultimately going to be in bondage to sin, which if we really love someone, not just feel for them, but love someone, that's the last thing that we would want for them. We love people by wanting what is best for them as God defines best. And so just pulling ourselves outside of what we feel. It's not wrong to feel feelings aren't wrong, but asking ourselves what's true. Um, I would say in, as we apply this to all of these very human centered identity centered issues, that is a really good way to check ourselves. All of us, myself included. We're kind of on the forefront of all these cultural issues. You are always tackling, I mean, everything going on in culture. I don't know how you do it. Do you think American society has passed the point in which it could be salvaged or do you see a brighter future ahead? What are your thoughts on that? Mm, it's, I mean, it's going to be a miracle. It's going to be a work of God if we can come together as a country because we've always had disagreements. Obviously we had a civil war. That was a really big disagreement. We've always had divisions as a country, but I think our divisions now are much more fundamental than they were even then. I mean, we are talking about existential human nature disagreements about what is male, what is female? When does life begin? When does it matter? Like we are seeing a civilizational collapse because we no longer prioritize getting married and having kids. I mean, that is really big, fundamental, foundational, civilizational, existential stuff we're talking about that we just have completely disparate views on in this country. And so it would take a spiritual awakening. It would take changing hearts of stone into hearts of flesh by the mercy of God to change this country. That's And God can do that. He absolutely can. He may not. That might not be where his mercy goes. I think sometimes we believe that America is like the center in the apocalyptic narrative that we are going to play a big role in the end times. That's not necessarily true. We're another nation. Empires rise and fall all the time throughout history. I hope for the sake of us, for the sake of our kids, for the sake of our grandkids, that God will continue to extend his mercy, that there will be a spiritual awakening in this country, but Christians have to continue to be a refuge of clarity and courage in an age of chaos and cowardice and God will choose to use us however he wants.